We're in our final stretch. We have one more presenter, uh, Michael Klinger, who's the managing director at uh, Language Transactions. Uh, basically, he <laughs> wealth of experience again. It seems like all our, our our speakers today have had a wealth of experience in our in our industry, which is incredible. Hi, Michael. How you doing? Hey, Brian. Oops, did I did I do the wrong thing? You want no, to you're perfect. You, you're all good. Okay. Brian, I can see it. Mike's working. We're all good. Um, so basically, just want to. Uh, yeah, let you have as much time as possible. You're, you're our last one. You have the big spot. We're finishing with a bang. So yeah. uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, and I'll pop back in probably with about five minutes or 10 minutes left to uh, go through Q&A. Sounds great. Thanks. Handing it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, share. Let's see. Oh, here we go. I love this technology. Yep. We can see your background right now. All right. I just need to give you a, give me a second. Uh, what I want to do is share my screen, right? Yep, we can see your background right now. With, uh, and it is now unshared. <laughs> okay, yeah, I want to share screen and then just do a, just love technology. Yeah, likely a share screen button. There we go. Yeah, Starting right. to share your screen, and there's your presentation. All right. Okay, I'll hop back great. out. Great. All right. Brian, thanks, by the way. You guys did a great job. Uh, it's amazing. I was very impressed with you and the whole team. So uh, thanks Thank again you. for this. Um, pretty impressive. Um, so I should have a slideshow happening right now. Let's see. Where, there we go. Okay. All so right. You're all set. I'll, I'll talk for about uh, 20, 25 minutes and we jump into questions if you want. Um, I think a lot of us, like a lot of us, we don't really know what's going on. We're, we're making our best guesses. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a, a brief history, uh, kind of like perspectives, at economy and how that impacted the language industry, and then talk specifically about language owners and employees and, and lemonade. And I'll get more specific about that and just end it with some of perspectives that we can we can have. So first off, if we think, take a step back and look at human history, this, this pandemic is unprecedented, but, but we've been going through plagues and fires and droughts and starvations for 100,000 years. So it's not, this is not new for, if you go back to think about your grandfather, great grandfather, grandmother, I'm sure they've been through a lot. If you, you pulled them out and interviewed them and they said, uh, you know, what do you think of what we're suffering through? I think they might be less empathic than you'd be, than you'd expect. Um, I think what's happened recently, there's two things that we noticed that the, there's really a gap in the haves and the have nots. So those people on the front lines who are the grocery, grocery packers or um, delivering papers or in immigrants who are stuck in uh, dormitories, that's quite a have not challenge. Um, but a lot of us have to sit at home and uh, wave the grocery store. So there is just perspective. It, it may not be um, so far, um, the challenges that we, we are facing are not as big as what's happened historically. And imagine if we, we brought someone here from San Francisco to interview someone from Kabul, Afghanistan, not only is there the coronavirus, but people are, are worried about their life. So there's perspective there. I mean, 9-11 was another unprecedented activity. And I remember, you know, we we're all watching these planes go into the World Trade Center and hijack planes. And I remember people wouldn't go outside of their house. You know, little small towns wouldn't go to the library because they're afraid of uh, they were going to be bombed. Just again, gaining perspective, what, what we did there was, well, what the world did was a bunch of security in, in the airports, which made sense. And then what we did was invade Iraq, we as in the... U.S. Um, and started this war on terror. But what we see here with the coronavirus, there's really no human enemy. We've met the enemy and he is us. I think what we're really dealing with here is how are we going to, uh, how are we going to mitigate the risk and slow down the virus? Economically, if you look at uh, recessions and depressions in the U.S. and worldwide, in 29, the, huge, the stock market crashed. Uh, there were people jumping off buildings. My father, incidentally, worked on Wall Street and remember seeing people jumping off buildings. I don't think we're doing that right now. Um, 
the banks panicked. And I think the big problem then with the feds didn't increase the money supply. So in the US, the depression lasted longer than 10 years. And many, many economists say it went through the World War II. Um, but eventually the economy did recover and probably we have a stronger economy now than, uh, than ever, or we did have. So go back to the recession of 2001, 2003. And that's was around the time 9-11 happened. Uh, it was the dot-com burst and uh, Dow Jones dropped significantly. We were in the staffing business in the globalization space and we had a multiple large technology clients. Uh, Microsoft, Oracle, eBay, EMC, IBM. We worked with these accounts and almost all of them had layoffs of the globalization team before they touched their initial teams, the engineering team, the testing team. There was 6% unemployment in the country, but there was a glut of globalization personnel unemployed. Fast forward to 2007, and that many economists say it was probably the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, it was the housing bubble, credit conditions, deregulation, and the weakened financial institutions. Unemployment went from 4.5% to about 10% by 2009. But there were minimal layoffs in the globalization space. Uh, we worked with the same companies, IBM, Oracle, eBay, EMC, Cisco, uh, Microsoft was an exception, but uh, there were minimal layoffs. And, and at that time, we kind of uh, spoke about that and why asked people what they thought. And the consensus was that we've really, in the globalization industry, we, we reached a kind of maturity. You know, teams were more cost effective. We had better processes. Turnaround was faster. Technologies were more, uh, more sophisticated. Um, and tools were better. So the return on investment for an individual in the globalization group was much higher possibly than it was before. So here we are in 2020. Um, we were on a 12 year bull run. We were gonna head into a recession at some point. <laughs> we headed smack into a recession. Um, you know, when you think no sporting events, it's unprecedented in this country, cultural events, I mean, hotels are, are not existing. I mean, they're, they're, restaurants are going out of business and there's large unemployment. Dow Jones is a deep slide and hopefully this guy gets out of office in, in another six months. But th this could last uh, many years. Uh, we don't know. So core globalization units are probably in the same boat as other business units. The whole world is impacted. So we don't know really where how that's going to impact the globalization industry. But, you know, we know all those of you who run interpreting companies, you know that uh, on-site interpreting has clearly been impacted. So, but most of the services that we provide in the language industry are remote localization teams, translators, freelancers, OPI, VRI. It's a virtual business, which is, which is a good precedent for, uh, for what's happening now. So here we are, what, what can we expect? Um, you know, a few people reach out to me, Mike, what's going to happen? I, I have no idea. Uh, but I mean, common sense at this point in time, as in with other recessions, you need to lower your costs, however you can do that. Um, and you want to increase sales efforts. But uh, as businesses, you can apply for support from the government. As individuals, you can apply for support. Um, I think morale is an important part right now. You know, the intangibles and, and a big piece of what's going on right now is find ways to diversify your business. I know I said lower costs, but I, I encourage language owners to be creative when dealing with your employees. Um, I know some people just want to let go, let people go. I, I don't think that's the best first step. Uh, I would advise people to take care of your team creatively. Be transparent. You know, if your budget is X and you're losing Y, let companies, let your people know why. Maybe you ask your top management to lower salaries. Maybe you invite employees to take unpaid vacations. Uh, maybe you, um, 
this is a joke, but ask your employees to intern at a competitor and then report back to you. I mean, find ways to deal with what's going on. Maybe you request employees create their own business plan. I think an interesting uh, way to look at this when you are an employee is think of yourself as an individual profit center for your business. How are you, who you work for your company, making money and what's your return on investment for you as an individual? I think that's a good way to start to look at yourself and at your contribution to the business. You know, as a business, you want to be creative. What does the market need right now? Well, obviously low cost, and we're working with remote and virtual employees. Maybe you partner with a vendor in South America and you offer project management at $25 an hour. Maybe you work with a team in India and you offer engineering at you know, $30 an hour. Uh, this is a time where you can improve what you offer. I think a lot of us are staying home and there's more <laughs> Home Depot and Lowe's are, are doing a great business. People are fixing their own houses. I, I think this is a time to fix your business. There are services improving, improve your offers. Get a, a better, um, get closer to your best practices. This is also a time maybe you find a partnership with a technology that is gonna be interesting. You know, simultaneous interpreting apps for hospitals. Hospitals still desperately need uh, technology for languages. Multilingual platform for remote simultaneous interpretation. Uh, Zoom is, is doing amazing business. Uh, so how can we help that on the language side? Maybe you partner with a hybrid MT solutions business. That's, uh, then it offers your clients cost savings. We're in the staffing business, by the way. Uh, that's one of the businesses we do. And so we're hearing of people getting unemployed. If you're unemployed, take a step back. <laughs> Most of us are, um, we're hooked on this, the language industry. We've been in there for 25 years. Is this something you wanna do? Um, and if so, what areas would you like to explore. I think if you look at growth sectors in the industry, again, remote services, MT is, you know, life sciences and pharma is still very important. So maybe you take some time to study and focus and enter into an industry that is of interest to you. I know, a, I know a, we're working with an owner who wants to sell her business and become a translator again. Uh, maybe you want to go back to freelance translation. But I encourage you now to think outside the box if you are not working. I know it's a little scary to do, but uh, it's a perfect time to say, hey, I could start a virtual post-MT editing business. I could uh, get my project manager from uh, Argentina. I could get my software engineer from India. And I go back to the client that I just left and say, hey, I know what you're doing with your, M your, your MT business and I could provide a much cheaper service for post-MT editing and you'd have a better quality uh, translation, for example. Or this may be the time you've always wanted to work for these three, four, five companies. You take a step back and send out a reach out to the CEO via LinkedIn and say, hey, I, I'm interested in working for you. I, I'll do a six week internship for free uh, to make a trial to buy. And if you like, if you like what I do, uh, please hire me. We're also, as I mentioned, a staffing agency. Uh, there are localization agencies in Europe and the US. If you wanna go back to the same, same business, hop on a website and see what jobs are out there to, to revisit. Sometimes people say, yeah, yeah, it's easy for you to say be creative, but I need to pay the bills. So several months ago, there was the um, situation with uh, the U.S. government trying to get more tax money. So they wanted to convert a lot of the 1099s to W-2s. And California was one of the big markets. Um, and it created quite a, uh, a challenge to uh, in interpreting companies that employ freelance interpreters and now would have to pay additional costs for uh, payrolling them, uh, even if they only work for 10 hours a year. This is called AB5. So interpreting companies were scared, uh, independent contractors were scared, and <laughs> I saw SmartCat come out and say, hey, 
if you want to us to employ your 1099s and put them on as, in, in, as W-2, we can do that. Uh, it was a very creative uh, entrepreneurial move. And then this, as I mentioned to Brian, I, I think what you guys did, here's, here's a coronavirus, there's a pandemic, people are panicking, and you come up with a 12-hour free global seminar with industry experts. Uh, Brian is brilliant. Uh, Katya, Brian, uh, Lubia, there were several people I spoke to. Great job, guys. I think uh, it's good PR for SmartCat. So that's the idea with lemons make lemonade, and we're going to work with this theme because I'm on a six-day lemon, lemonade fast, so that's in my head. Um, there's a part two here, and, and I think it's important not to lose sight of that. So uh, here's a story, a true story. My daughter was five at the time, and uh, she decided she wanted to have a lemonade stand. So she woke up early on a Saturday. Um, she was little. She squeezed lemons. I think it took an hour and a half, two hours to put fresh honey in, mixed it all up, and uh, walked outside and just quietly opened her, her lemonade stand. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> across the street, there's an older boy. He decided also it was a hot summer weekend, and he was opening up his lemonade stand. And he had a radio blasting, loud music going. He had a huge sign. Um, and when cars went by, he'd scream out, hey, you know, free lemonade. And he had a, he used a lemonade mix. He, he kind of did it when he was out there. But at the end of the day, the, uh, my daughter, after two days, had a lot more business than he did. And he, it's a simple story. You just have to have good lemonade. It's not just marketing. So these guys have done a great job marketing. Smart Cat has to have a good product for people to stay. So, so my advice to, to businesses and to people is be creative and with better lemonade. I mean, this, this past month or two, I don't know how many calls and emails I've gotten with, you know, we're offering you a free this or discounted that, given the challenge of blah, 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 blah. I don't really trust that. And, I, I, and as a human being, I don't think you might either. So my, my advice to you in this industry is not to use gimmicks. And if you're gonna add a new service, reach out to your current clients, uh, the ones that know you and say, hey, given what's going on right now, we have a, a lower cost for your uh, editing process or for a lower cost for your MT implementation. Now, we don't know how long this process, the, the economy is gonna hit. Could be, you know, six months, could be five years. So uh, it's likely that it's gonna, you're gonna have to be working harder and smarter for the same results. But here's the flip side. I think as an owner, uh, you gotta have to ask yourself, how much juice for the squeeze? And what I mean by this is if you've been considering retiring or selling your language business, now may be a good time. Uh, most businesses in the language industry are not likely to grow extensively over the next few years. You're probably going to have to work harder and get the same results or worse. A lot of people are losing money. So if you're going to stay on, ask yourself how much juice for the squeeze. It's, a, it's, a, it's something to think about. So if you're thinking of selling, now might be a good time. I think that's a lemon, not an orange. Um, for those of you who are thinking of acquisitions, and I've gotten several calls about that, um, it, it again, uh, it might not be a bad time to acquire. Keep in mind, as you all do, you wouldn't be thinking this unless you have a solid uh, business and a solid financial history and good credit and a, and a bank that believes in you. But it may be a good time for acquisitions. And I say that because um, if, if you ever play the game of Monopoly, the, the, when you start, if you start buying properties, even if you have a little money in the bank, at some point, it kicks in and you, you win the game because people land on your properties and, and you, uh, you're able to charge more money. You may be able to find lower cost 
um, acquisitions at this point because of given that it's switched from a seller's market to a buyer's market. I mean, it's a very active marketplace. The other business that we do is an M&A. So I'm, I'm talking about specific experience. Right now, we probably work with over 50 strategic and professional buyers. Strategic meaning they're in the industry. Professional buyers mean they are private equity, VC, or individuals who've raised funds. So if you're a seller and you're thinking of uh, exiting, uh, first off, you, you do the common sense thing. You want to check on costs that can be lowered. Maybe there is somebody that can go from full-time to part-time. Maybe one of the owners is not really working so much, so you reduce that pay. Um, you know, if you have on-site, you want to make sure that your clients are aware that you have an OPI or VRI service. But, and then you prepare your financials and adjust them for the recession. Um, and another piece, a lot of owners, small owners say, hey, I want to be paid everything up front. Well, that's not going to happen. It wouldn't happen before, and it's not going to happen now. And sometimes payments were 50%. I think now they go to, um, it may be likely that you get less up front. But what you might get is a better overall price. And why do I say that? Because you, you can develop something, uh, what's called an earn out, and where you, if your business grows, you get paid more. So if you're a buyer and if you're a seller, find a buyer profile that works for you. So a buyer has a stronger, uh, maybe sales team, they have a better service offering, they have a good technology, they have a process that's impeccable. So knowing that if you join their team, you're gonna improve your business. Um, working with a company that does government work and they have certifications and the, the buyer wants to go into uh, that, that area. So that's a synergy for both of them. Um, you might have similar clients. Um, you might be in a similar vertical in life science. It's also important if you're going to sell and the buyer is to find some personal synergies. You don't want to just sell to anyone. I don't care what the, what the market is. You want to make sure that this, you can work with this person for the next six months or however long you want to stay on board. So you want to negotiate pricing based on an earnout, as opposed to uh, at an upside, as opposed to a fixed price. Uh, because an earnout meaning you do a million dollars this year, year two with this new company, you might do a million five, and then you get paid for that differential in your profit or. So we're getting the home stretch because I talk quickly and whatever. It's been a long day, I'm sure, for some of you. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about perspectives. Uh, an interesting conversation with a colleague of mine. He was at one point in the airline industry, and this was back in 2001. And he was flying into a, a conference in Canada. And uh, it was a weekend conference, and he was going to get an early flight out uh, on the Monday morning, I believe. Um, and uh, a magazine reporter reached out who knew him and said, hey, I'd love to talk to you about the industry and what you see and what you can do. And it'd be the next morning. Are you free? And he said, oh, you know, I'm not really free. I, I'm planning, you know, I think I'm going to get a flight out that next morning. Um, and uh, she talked to him and basically they went back and forth and at the last minute he decided, hey, I'll skip the flight, I'll sit and talk with you and I'll catch a later flight. That the flight he missed was the one that flew into the World Trade Center. Um, and he, he has a great approach. So I spoke to him uh, last week and he said, I said, how are you doing? He said, <laughs> his business, the on-site business is probably losing about 60% revenue currently. And it's a big company. $12, $50 million company. He sounded very calm. He said, Mike, I, I, uh, I think the most important thing during this crisis is to keep a balanced mental approach. And clearly he was. And, and a lot of us are losing money or scared and a lot of us are unemployed. I think that's good advice. So 
In closing, I just invite you to start with the end in mind, just keeping a little bit of perspective. This is not an easy time for a lot of people. You know, people are dying, there's businesses are closing, unemployment is growing, um, public events are closed, there's social distancing. But I think humanity's lived through worst. So if you can find a silver lining and gain a perspective, a balanced mental approach, this too will pass. Alrighty, sir. I'm open to uh, questions or whatever. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just have to uh, kind of laugh a little bit. I know this is, uh, your presentation was great, but there's a lot of people that are comparing your voice to Al Pacino. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard that before? Never. Is it, and it, it's not just... One of <laughs> it's, uh, so you've, you've got this very relaxed Al Pacino voice. I don't know. Oh, I'm that's sorry. great. Okay. But uh, made the presentation all that much better. So, good, um, good. Right. So obviously, yeah, you've got a lot of information here. I think a lot of sound advice for, for people that are, you know, thinking either they're selling or those looking to acquire, perhaps, um, mm -hmm. if you wanted to flip the perspective. Um, I think one of the things is perhaps you can just give a, a very quick, um, I guess, beginner's guide. So a small LSP, um, you know, someone's heading into retirement. Uh, they're, they're, I guess their company's okay, not too much money. Is right. there an amount that is, or a size of company that's too small to sell? Right, right. Uh, good question, Brian. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, I mean, I had a company that was maybe 100,000 and another, another buyer was interested. I think, I think the challenge for a small business owner who's been doing this for 25 years is um, they might think they're, they're, more, they're worth more than they are. I think the challenge is realistic mm. expectations of, of what their value is. So if you're a million dollar business and your profit is say 300,000, which is a great profit, a net profit, uh, so it's a 30%, your value would be roughly three times the net profit. It would be less than the revenue that you get. But right. Up to owners and they say, geez, they're a million dollar company. I want to sell for 2 million. And you say, that's not going to happen. So I think part of it is that. I think part of it is, uh, I mean, the good news, I, I talk about selling your businesses. I, I'm from New York. Is Pacino from New York? Maybe that's it. But uh, <laughs> you know, the first time I rode the subways in, in Manhattan when I was, I, I lived outside in Queens and in Long Island, I got totally lost. But once you learn how to travel the subways, it's not that complicated. So we do language brokerage services. So I know how to do it at this point. But if you're selling for the first time, it's like getting on the subway for the first time. There's just five or six things you need to know. And, and one of them you know, is preparing your financials and two is knowing what your value is. And then, and then three is, you know, where do I find a buyer? What do I do? You know? right. But, and then the exit strategy is basically, you find someone you wanna work with and say, hey, I'll stay on for six months and transition my business um, and uh, I'll help you find a replacement, right? Uh, uh, what's his name? Is sold his business to Smart Cat uh, uh, Jean Luc. And yes, good person absolutely. To talk to. So he, it was you know, it's a process. Mm -hmm. I always encourage people to find, uh, you know, we're the middle person, but to find a buyer that they feel connected with. It's not right. just a business transaction; it's your whole life that you're passing off. So. Fair. Um, okay, I think that's very good. Um, clarification, I don't think you sold it to SmartCat. I think it was a, a company prior to uh, SmartCat. Oh, was it? Okay. Very respective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just wanted to, to clarify that point. The, so what is, for example, a, uh, a good transition period or a realistic transition period? I mean, there are people, as you said, they just want to get the cash and they're out, um, nice. which you said won't happen. Um, so what, what is that transition, transition period looking? So again, it's, it's really, if, if you've, what this virus is causing us to do is to think for not just ourselves, but other people. Right. Selling your business, you know how long, how important you are to the business. So mm -hmm. if you say you sell your business and you know that you need to help the transition for the next six months for this to work, you don't want to leave in three months, right? So mm -hmm. the point being, how long is a transition? It's really how long you can make a successful transition so that the bulk of your accounts are going to land in that other company. It's like, it's tri like transplanting something. You have right. to put it enough till it starts to grow in the new, in the new territory. 
Mm -hmm. So you don't want to leave before that happens. Some people, it could be three months. You talk to some owners, they've been out of the pop process for a few years. It's their production team. So right. they say, I can sell this business and leave in two months. And then I, maybe I'll stay on call, uh, you know, once a week for, uh, you know, 200 bucks and you call me with any problems, right? But so to, the transition depends on how long it takes for you to transition those accounts successfully. Okay. I think, yeah, I think that's clear. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the things that I also see in the, in the language industry is a lot of language companies don't necessarily, they have revenue, they have great clients, recurring clients, but they don't necessarily have agreements in place. So how does this impact the, the sale? Yeah, no, these are all good <laughs> questions. Are you in this field? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a problem on one level, especially mm -hmm. for equity. They go, well, what are your contracts? He says, we don't have contracts. You don't have contracts. So that scares them. Another thing that scares private equity is <laughs> your revenue has gone down the last three or four years. And you say, mm -hmm. well, I want to sell and leave now. They say, no. For them, it's like catching a falling knife. You don't want to buy your company if you're losing revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to, to address... Um, once you know that strategic buyers understand the industry. So you say, look, I don't have a contract signed, but with this account, I've worked for the past 10 years. They love us. Talk to, you, talk to this account. So it, for most uh, successful entrepreneurs who have their own business, they have long-term accounts because both sides like each other. They work well together, the buyer and the seller. I mean, the uh, client. Yep. And the, so that's, even though there's no contract in place, They've been doing business for the past 10 years. So unless, again, the transplant fails, they're going to continue to work there. Fair. And is that enough to reassure the, the potential buyer? So for a strategic buyer, typically yep. it is. For, for a private equity guy, they're going to want something more. And in both cases, you, you, a lot more and more uh, buyers are building in. They don't have a fixed price. They say, look, we, we think you're worth this. Yep. So next year, if you, you're making this, we'll pay you this. But if you're making less, we're going to pay you less. You make right. more, we'll pay you more. So you mitigate the risk by, by saying, I know you said you've been doing a million dollars and you're going to do five million next year. I don't, I, I believe you, but let's put this in place. Okay. So if you do this revenue, we'll pay you this. If you do more, we'll pay you more. If you do less, we pay you less. I think that that's logical. It makes sense. Yeah. Um, listen, I think that a lot of people have... Um, again, voice their, their um, how much they liked the presentation. I had just one question come in. I'm going to pop over to it. If you don't mind, I just got to pull sure. it over here. Um, so why do you think the language market has stayed fragmented? Uh, lots of small vendors throughout all this time, uh, and it hasn't seemed to change. So we consistently have small players. Right, right. Oh, God, who knows? There's, there's no, <laughs> you know, it's a $50 billion according to some, maybe it's $25 billion according to others, but you or I could start a translation business tomorrow. Uh, Is that an offer or? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well not yet, I don't, I don't know you well enough, but if you can market these things, if you can do one more event like this with 1,500 people, maybe we'll come up with something. Um, <laughs> I, uh, what I mean is there's low barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of people have entered and, you know, they started doing, you know, Corey Lindo started with one, one account that he left and he's very successful. You know, he went back to, you know, it was Oracle or whoever it was, I don't remember. Right. But so the reason it's fragmented, you know, uh, anyone can start it, right? Um, and a lot of people can be successful and do fairly well and have a remote team that they don't have to pay on staff. So mm -hmm. style choice for many people and they stay in it. You know, they make a few hundred thousand dollars and they don't work like a, uh, crazy and there you go. I think that I think that just about covers it. I mean, we've uh, exhausted the questions. Uh, listen, I want to thank you again for your time today, the presentation, uh, the Al Pacino voice, um, everything. Uh, it was great, very clear, um, well paced, and I think it allowed a lot of people to get uh, a lot of perspective that they may have been missing in the past. Um, so thank you for that. Again, I, I really appreciate it, and I'm sure you're going to start receiving a lot of uh, LinkedIn requests. Um, I myself, if I'm not already connected with you, I'll, I'll send one out as well. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank Frank. you very much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.